I have a reminder on my phone that goes off at two o'clock every day and it says, you are not your mind, you are the one that hears it. You know, that idea that the feelings are feelings and they will pass and that it's okay. Because I think for a lot of ADHDs, having a big emotional response to things, whether that's kind of upset or a sense of injustice or excitement a lot of the time, whatever that kind of emotional reaction is, knowing that it's transient and that it will pass. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 225 of ADHD for Smartass Women. I hope that you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyotsuka.com. My purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. In the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, well, you already know this. I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something. Not one. And so, of course, I am just delighted to introduce you to Sarah Robinson. Sara Robinson is an award-winning writer and PR strategist specializing in brand storytelling, content design, training, and high-impact PR campaigns. After an early career in television and newspapers, Sara has spent over two decades working in PR and has supported hundreds of brands, startups, and charities. Her clients have ranged from the Welsh government and the UK's national parks to major house builders, health charities, insurance companies, and soccer clubs. Sarah was named the 2012 Institute of Directors Young Director of the Year in Wales. Other career highlights include devising a multi-channel PR campaign that significantly boosted the number of inquiries about adopting a child in Wales, meaning more children found forever homes as a result. She is also an elected Labour Party local politician, representing her district on Cardiff City Council since May of 2022. Her passions are tackling poverty and exclusion, gender equality, creating more livable neighborhoods, and protecting green spaces tackling climate change. She appreciates that this is a long list of passions, then again, ADHD. Based in Cardiff, the capital of Wales in the United Kingdom, she writes a column for Wales national newspaper, The Western Mail, and was named Columnist of the Year at the Wales Media Awards in 2022. She is also a regular contributor to BBC Radio. Her many interests include running, travel, paddleboarding, art, comedy, social justice, live music, festivals, and spending quality time with her partner, David, and teenage son, James. Sarah lives with her son, James, and pet dog, Joni, after Joni Mitchell. She was diagnosed with ADHD in August 2022 at the age of 41. Sarah, did I get all of that right? And there was a lot of all there. (laughs) There was a lot. There's such a lot. But you did. Absolutely. Hello, Tracy. I'm so pleased to be um, speaking with you today. Thank you for having me. Yes. Well, welcome. So before we go into all the things you do, can we talk about your ADHD diagnoses first? 
Sure. Um, so it's less than a year since I was diagnosed. Um, I was diagnosed last August, so last summer, and um, I kind of had an inkling that I might have it for about 18 months before that. Um, a family member was diagnosed um, and I, yeah, somebody mentioned it to me as something that perhaps I would want to look at. And I guess at the time, um, like so many people, and this is why I'm really passionate and why about ADHD now and why I'm really happy to be on this podcast with you today. Um, all I knew or what thought I knew about ADHD, I guess, is that it was about kind of badly behaved boys. Um, and it's something that, you know, you treat with Ritalin and it, it's not possibly something that an adult woman um, could have. So I kind of put it in a box for a bit. And then I started looking into it um, a little bit. And the more that I read and the more kind of podcasts that I listened to, which is a very ADHD thing to do now, I realise I just started seeking out all the information that I possibly could to see whether this was a hat that fitted me. Um, and the more I read and the more I listened and the more particularly the stories of other women with ADHD, the more I realised, oh, my God, this <laughs> this sounds like me. <laughs> all of it kind of felt like it fitted or so much of it felt like it fitted. But at the time I was fighting an election campaign so I was incredibly busy and obviously running a business I'm a single mum so I didn't really have the bandwidth um to kind of dive into it I guess I guess I just wasn't ready so what I did during that time was I just kind of slowly absorbed as much as I could uh, about ADHD and the way I did that <laughs> was listening to lots and lots of podcasts and yours was the first that I discovered and it was so reassuring to hear other women who, you know, all of your guests just do wonderful things in the world are kind of achieving change or are running brilliant businesses. And I was really inspired by listening to these women. But more importantly, it made me realize that it was okay. <laughs> and I felt not alone. And I felt like actually I could be part of a community and maybe this wasn't the terrifying new thing that I that I thought it that I thought it was, I guess. So finally, last August, the election was over and I felt like I finally had some kind of space, I guess, had some space in my life to seek out the diagnosis. Um, and so I was diagnosed with combined ADHD. And the really funny thing was I didn't tell a lot of people at first, um, but the people that I did tell, every single one of them had exactly the same reaction, which was, yeah, that's the least surprising news ever. <laughs> <laughs> So then, Can I ask you, um, your friend that 18 months prior to that had said, you know what, I think you should look into this. What did he or she say to you that made you think, oh, maybe they're right? Uh, so that's a complicated one. This was a family member um, mm -hmm. who had found out about the diagnosis of another family member. And she was very kind about it. She said, maybe it's just something you might want to look at. She was very sort of subtle and, and tactile, actually. And I should give her a shout out. That's Lisa, <sighs> um, who, who is my half sister, who didn't push it, but just kind of did enough to put it on my radar, I guess. Um, yeah. And that's, and then, you know, it was in my mind and I couldn't get rid of it. And I, I kind of thought, well, I went through that whole process, which I think a lot of people do um, around diagnosis, which was, well, even if I do have ADHD, do I really need to know? You know, I'm 40 years of age. I've made it this far. Um, you know, that whole kind of debate or internal dialogue about whether a label is helpful or not. Um but I'm really, really glad. I'm sure we'll come on to talk about this. But actually, the diagnosis was so important to me. It was it was huge in, in lots of ways. Um, and I'm really glad that I'm really glad that she I had that conversation with her. Yeah, I just it's life changing. It's been life changing in a way that she would never have realized at the time. So tell me why you feel that getting diagnosed was so important. It wasn't enough to read all about it and really relate and see yourself in it you had to get the diagnosis. It was important for you. Yeah, I guess there was something about the, the certainty. There was something about certainty and something about community for me as well, I think, because, and I'm sure so many of your listeners will identify with this, for so long in my life, I felt like an outsider, even in rooms where, um, you know, I might have been the person <laughs> kind of delivering the talk or, um, you know, running the business or, you know, I, I never quite felt like I fitted in from a very, very early age. Um, 
and through discovering the you know wonderful community that you have built around your podcast I'd also like to give a shout out to a fantastic whatsapp group um that I hope I can give you the link to that you, so you can put it in the show notes um that I joined that was started by a fantastic woman with um ADHD in the UK called Adele Wimsett who's also um, a specialist in hormones and how they interact with ADHD I joined that whatsapp group and I said so, I'm kind of, sorry Sarah what is her name? Sorry, Adele, A-D-E-L-E. Okay, like the singer. Uh, yes, that's it. And Wimsett, W-I-M-S-E-T-T. Um, and I can send you a link after the recording so you can put it in the show notes if you like. Yes, please. Um, shall I pick up from, from there? Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I know that there would be listeners saying, wait, what was that? Yeah, so I, I want know. to make sure we get it in the show notes. <laughs> and, and absolutely, I would encourage anybody to join this community because the, just the power of being able to connect with other people who face the same challenges, but who are also uniquely brilliant um, has been incredible for me. And I feel for the first time in my life, I really, really kind of, I, I feel like I... I feel like I have this community of people who understand and who I can turn to when I have questions and when, you know, especially about kind of managing the symptoms um, because I'm current, I'm not medicated. I've chosen not to go down the medication route. So I've just been on this journey of huge discovery and I could not have um, been on that journey, I guess, without kind of seeking out the help of other people who were diagnosed a lot sooner than I was. Yeah. So how... So you said this is a WhatsApp group, so it's like a text. So you just get all these texts? Yeah, well, can that you sounds like a nightmare, but obviously it works. <laughs> yeah, I should probably say it's the most ADHD WhatsApp group you can imagine. It's just if you miss a few days, there are hundreds and hundreds of messages, but the group is full. If you need it, you know, you can, how I tend to use it is if I have a question or something I, I'd like to find out more about, I use the search function to look for kind of keywords, but um, the women on there are brilliant, you know, super, super talented from all walks of life, doing loads of different interesting um, things and they're all really willing to share and so if somebody in the group is facing an issue I haven't I've only ever met one of the women in the group in real life so it's very much a virtual community but it, yeah it's been brilliant and, and I, going back to why I felt the diagnosis was important I guess I wanted that I just wanted that certainty I wanted to know I wanted that um that turning point I suppose because once I had the diagnosis I knew that I had to change some um some things about the way um in terms of my lifestyle in terms of how I manage stress um Mm -hmm. lots and lots of of kind of positive changes that I've been able to make as a result of the diagnosis um so yeah it wasn't about you know having adjustments made in the workplace because I am my own boss and I'm terrible at making adjustments for myself but um Mm -hmm. But um, I think it was just about having, I don't think of it as a label. I think of it as um, an explanation for a lot of things yeah. kind of that have happened in my life and a, a lot of the decisions that I've made and a lot of the ways that I work. And, and now I'm able to embrace those um, and I'm able to kind of make positive decisions based on what I know works for me. Uh, and I guess that's what has been the big game changer. Well, it's really hard to make changes if you don't even understand why you do what you do, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, And I think that was the thing. For so long, I didn't understand why I kind of worked a certain way, why, you know, I was never very good in a nine to five um, kind of environment. I'm really, really good at working late into the evening, for example. Um, There are loads of of examples of where... um, I just don't fit in to kind of, I've never felt like I fitted in into regular boxes. And that goes back to my childhood, I suppose, the the kind of, um, you know, the hyper focus. I can see this now so clearly. It was always there. The impulsivity was always there. The love of learning, that even the entrepreneurialism, you know, that started at a really young age. So, Sarah, I'm curious, what was your childhood like and how did you do in school? So um, that's a really interesting one because everybody thinks their childhood is just normal, I guess. But I look back and realise that all the signs of ADHD were there. But I was brought up in the 80s um, in the South Wales Valleys, uh, you know, very working class family. My dad was a minor. There were four um, siblings. So life was 
um, yeah, just kind of chaotic. And um, for my parents, it was a lot about survival and they absolutely did their, you know, utmost to give us the, the best possible life. Um, I was lucky enough to go to a really great school. Um, but I can absolutely see that there were things in my childhood that I could draw a direct line between <laughs> the kind of those things and, and where I am today. So um, in terms of ADHD traits, I was pretty obsessive. I always loved learning. So I was very bright. Um, my mum says that I was reading by the age of three, and I'm never quite sure if that's true or whether I just learned to memorise um things but my party trick was I would read newspapers out for um babysitters and they would reward me with <laughs> kind of sweets and, and things like that so I learned really early I guess that um yeah just kind of being impressive and be- being bright and remembering things was a way to um be rewarded and so but even though I was bright I was quite I guess I'm going to use inverted commas here but I was quite naughty and mischievous but I, d- I don't like the word naughty but I was often in trouble for doing things that I realise now was just my inquisitive mind. So um, I often wanted to know how things worked and kind of just pushing boundaries a little bit too far. Yeah, so quite an interesting paradox. I was, you know, I was bookish and I loved to study. I loved to read. I was obsessed with, um, I had this brilliant set of encyclopedias. Um, They were Disney encyclopedias. And so they were kind of narrated by Donald Duck and his nephews and they were ridiculous. And they were traveling around the world and I used to get lost in those encyclopedias. Remember, this is pre-internet listeners. So yeah. <laughs> th- these were my kind of passport to the world, I guess. Um, and I was always daydreaming about what, what was it like to, um, you know, go to Peru or go to all of these kind of interesting places. Um, so yeah, always daydreaming, which is interesting in terms of the combined ADHD because um, that kind of daydreaming has never really left me but it's where I I kind of find a lot of my creativity in that space I guess um but yeah absolutely difficulty focusing difficulty sitting still quite fidgety um I was easily bored um, and and that's something that you know has been a theme throughout my life I guess but the other thing was injustice so politics was a really big thing in our house my dad was um, a miner you know he was um, there was a big miner strike in in the UK in 1984 when Margaret Thatcher our prime minister at the time was trying to um, close down all of our coal mines and I would go on the picket line as a toddler with my dad and in, in, in my buggy because my mum had to go out to work. So from a very early age, um, I, I, I kind of lived and was brought up in a very political environment and was very aware of social justice and the injustices all around us, and particularly in the South Wales Valleys, which are incredibly, you know, part, pockets of the valleys are incredibly deprived because of kind of decades and decades of, of neglect and lack of investment, really. Um, mm-hmm. And I saw that growing up. I saw that all around me and I saw the impact that, that kind of had on families and the impact it had on individuals and then on a wider scale the impact that has on communities and I was I just remember being conscious of that um from a very very young age so yeah and I guess the other thing that I think about in terms of my childhood is I was very entrepreneurial so um and I don't know if this comes from just you know being from a kind of quite a poor background but uh, I was always setting up things and um so I was that kind of stereotype of a kid that set up a tuck shop or I'd kind of resell chocolate biscuits and add a margin onto the top mm-hmm. or you know whatever I could find really but yeah just kind of loved the idea of having a business one day that was always something that I you know I didn't know it then I wouldn't have been able to articulate it in that way I don't I don't think but yes so but that was fun for you yeah, absolutely fun. Um, and I always had this thing about just following whatever I was interested in. And, you know, that absolutely the hyper focus was always there. So I guess in my early teens, I became really interested in music, obsessively interested in music. And this was about the time of Britpop, what, you know, Oasis and Blur and kind of all of that. So I got really, really into the Beatles. And then I spent six months doing nothing but listening to a, a box set of the Beatles that my uncle um, gave to me. And then by 14, I was writing for my local newspaper. And by 15, I had a regular music column, um, which is a whole other story. In oh, itself, my gosh. How I landed that. But, yeah, I guess I just always had that that kind of, well, why not? You know, like, go try things and just just ask, you know, be that, that kind of fearlessness. But I don't think it was a fearlessness because 
I wasn't actually that confident. Um, I was just really interested in the things I was interested in. And the the beauty, of course, so in terms of being entrepreneurial, the beauty of having a music column was that um, all of the record companies would then put you on their mailing list and send you um, CDs. And so it meant that for years, um, because I wrote that column well into my mid-20s, I would get all of my music for free and I would get free gig tickets. So suddenly I became very popular. (laughs) So I I kind of worked out that there were ways that you could, I guess uh, one word I used to use is just blagging things, you know, (laughs) just if you want to listen to music, if you want to go to cool gigs and see good bands, well, you can't quite afford it. So here's another way to do it because I'd always loved writing um, and I absolutely knew that I wanted to write one day. So, and my, you know, that thing about spotting patterns and kind of seeing connections, I just worked out very early mm-hmm. that if I wrote about the thing I loved, then I would be allowed to indulge myself in lots more of the thing that I loved. Um, and yeah, it was it was a really fun time for me. So I was do I started my career a lot earlier than um, kind of yeah most people are still working out what they want to do for their GCSEs, I guess. But I was already kind of in the world that I knew I wanted to end up in. So. While you're doing all this, you're still going to school. And are you doing well in school or are you not in school? Yes, I was absolutely doing well in school. Um, okay. Um, I did really well in my GCSEs, um, kind of straight A grades. And then something happened. <laughs> so um, I think about a year into my A levels, I've been spending. So, a lot would that, so, A levels, would that be college? Well, no. So we have a, you can do them in college in the UK, but A-levels are also often done in school. So you stay, um, we call it sixth form. So you stay for two years between 16 to 18 to do your A-levels, which is uh, you pick kind of three or four subjects usually um, for A-levels before going to university. And the expectation in my family was that I would go. Um, I would be the first one in my family to go but you know I'd had by this point I'd had poetry published I'd read at literary festivals I had um you were beyond college at that point <laughs> well I think I don't know I just loved writing that's all I loved and mm. I started to find school just unstimulating and and challenging and it was very hard for me to kind of be going to gigs um you know writing about bands and interviewing bands and um and then I'd have to go to school in my uniform and sit through a geography lesson and just think mm-hmm. kind of staring out the window just thinking about what I wanted to write and I just found it increasingly difficult so I actually left school at the age of 17 much to my parents disappointment because mm. um, I'd been offered a job working for a TV company which they thought was the worst decision I could ever make and um why <laughs> well because I think they, there was this real working class thing in terms of social mobility that what you do is if you have the opportunity and you have the talent then you should go to university and you should kind of see that through um I now feel very differently because I have a son and you know i he wants to go to university and I really hope that he does because I think mm. having um you know three years where you can kind of find yourself, if you like, is probably a valuable thing to do. But I found myself in other ways, I'd say. Um, but yeah, I guess I was so far ahead of my peers in terms of my life experience by that point, And I was bored. Um, and I wanted to go out into the world. I wanted to earn. I wanted to meet interesting people. I wanted to work on interesting things. And I just couldn't see any of that happening through the school route for me. So it was a huge surprise. My teachers were surprised. My parents were kind of devastated. But I just announced one day. Um, that that's it I was because I'd applied for this job without telling them either which was kind of yeah I imagine I look back now and just feel very sorry for my <laughs> for my parents um, and just said yeah that's it I'm off to work for a tv company and I'm moving away from home and I was 17 and um, yeah it was all rather difficult but eventually um, my dad a few years later kind of called me up and said that he was really proud of me so it took a little bit took a little while for them to come around but there was no telling me I think the other thing was um you know that thing about authority yeah I I just wouldn't be told I could never Mm. be told what to do what to do once I'd made my mind up about something that was it and so um yeah so off I went so I was very academic so Sarah with hindsight did you make the right decision Well, I'm a big, I kind of really believe that you should never regret the things you did. I've often regretted the things that I didn't do in my life, opportunities I didn't take, um, of which there have been quite a few. But 
yes, I do think I made the right decision. Yes, that job would gave me a great grounding for what came next. Um, it taught me to be independent. Uh, it allowed me to write. It allowed me to travel. I worked in the south of France. I did some really interesting, um, cool stuff, I guess. And for a 17-year-old, you know, I was earning really decent money. And, yeah, I guess... When I look back, though, the thing that I really wish I'd done, because I've had a lifelong love of learning and it hasn't stopped, you know, um, just last week, this is classic ADHD. I'm very, very busy at the moment. And I decided to sign up for a course in feminism and social justice last week. Because oh, see, I would love a course in that. <laughs> Any opportunity. Yeah. It was a four week course. Um, it was absolutely brilliant. I learned so much. And I've tried to do that throughout my life, but I guess I just, I've educated myself, you know, I've read what um, I surround myself with people who know a lot more than me about things and I absorb things. So am I sorry I didn't go to university then? No. Uh, do I wish that I'd carved out some time in my life to do some kind of dedicated learning? Yes, um, is the answer to that, I suppose. But that's a, that's a continued class and something I think we can all do every day. And it sounds like you do it. Yeah. It's just society, right? It's these structures that we have in place that if you are going to be successful in life, you are going to go to university. And at least here in the in the States, I don't know about the UK. I mean, there are a lot of um corporations. I think Microsoft, Google, I mean, there's a there's a bunch of them that are no longer requiring a college education for employment and and higher level employment. Wow. Okay. That's super, that's really interesting. Um, and I can absolutely see why, because I, you know, I think for a lot of people I now know, um, especially who are neurodiverse and can bring a whole range of new thinking, and creative talents and skills, kind of traditional learning environments perhaps aren't the best uh, place for them to be. It, it certainly wasn't for me by the age of 17, you know, I was ready to do something very, very different. But I think, yeah, I, I don't believe we should be kind of forced into these boxes. I think that learning can happen in lots of different ways. And it should, for me, learning is a lifelong um, lifelong quest and, and a passion and something that I try and do every day, um, rather than something you just do once for three years before going out into the world, I, I guess. But um, but yeah, as a parent, I look at it you know, slightly differently. But, you know, we live in a capitalist system. And so sometimes you just yeah. Have- play by the rules I guess but um, I decided not to and I don't regret it not one bit Apple Apple was another one IBM Bank of America Dell Delta I mean there you know I I think we're finally realizing that (laughs) think about how many people you know that went to university and they are not doing so much with their life right now right when you compare it to what you're doing I mean you've experienced so many interesting things Yeah, I guess it's so so interesting because I obviously I ran um, my own business for set. I still do, but for a while I employed you know a fairly large team. Mm -hmm. I'd have people who I would employ who had just come out of a degree, but be absolutely nowhere near ready to go out into the world and and kind of do the things that that we did. So I'd I'd kind of have to train them in a a very particular way. Um, And I felt often that university didn't give graduates the skills necessarily that they needed to kind of succeed in in the workplace but I think a lot of for for me I never hired based on people's qualifications you know I would hire for attitude for aptitude for willingness to learn um for creativity it's just I think it's such a lazy shortcut because you know people are busy and you think well if they have a degree it means they've got a certain level of kind of competence or intelligence but yeah I certainly know plenty of people who disprove that theory sure (laughs) yeah so I know that you've struggled with rejection sensitive dysphoria because you told me and I'm curious that you've struggled with that yet you put yourself out there as a politician. And so I'm curious how those two things square and what your thoughts are today about this. Well, that's really interesting because timing is critical here. Um, when I decided- oh, Wait, 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 Sarah. Yeah. Let me give the definition of RSD because I always cool. assume everybody knows these words. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you do. But if you're new, you might be like, what? Rejection sensitive dysphoria, RSD, what is that? So it's the debilitating fear of rejection that is sometimes present with ADHD. I don't know if it was William Dodson who actually coined the term, Dr. William Dodson, but he seems to be the expert that is always cited when RSD is discussed. And according to Dodson, rejection-sensitive dysphoria or RSD 
what it is, is the person experiences. So someone with ADHD experiences extreme emotional sensitivity and pain triggered by the perception, whether it's real or imagined, of being rejected, teased, criticized, a disappointment to important people in their life, or disappointed in themselves when they fail to attain their own very high standards or goals. And according to Dotson, it's the one emotional condition that's found only with ADHD. I mean, not everybody has it, but um, I'm just really curious your thoughts around that. Oh, thank you for asking. I think this is a really important kind of part of ADHD. And in terms of your question, I didn't know I had ADHD when I decided to stand for election. And I often kind of ask myself, might, would I have made different decisions if I'd known? I guess my whole life, I knew I was sensitive and I knew that um, if I felt like I'd upset somebody or if um, I, oh, the worst thing you can ever say to me is that I've disappointed you. So, um, you know, the scene mm. in The Godfather, me dispiace, you know, it's like the worst <laughs> thing you can say to me is that I've disappointed you. And then, yeah, I had a partner once who used to say that he was disappointed in me quite a lot. And it was just, cr- it just felt like the worst kind of pain and cruelty. So, yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know this what RSD meant. I didn't know the acronym. I didn't know the term. It's something I very much kind of had to get my head around in the last year. But it is something that has shown up for me. But I think a lot of the time for me is shown up in an, in an internalized way. So I'm very self-critical and very harsh on myself if I feel I don't hit the kind of standards that I aspire to and the things that I do and the things that matter to me. But equally, if I feel like I've, you know, I've upset somebody or somebody doesn't like me without getting to know me, then, then that, that will have a big impact on me. Um, and that's Which would be so hard as a politician, right? Because right yeah. off the bat, people are just going like, to not like you. <laughs> right? yeah. you're, you're the wrong party. I don't like you. Yes, yes, yes. There's all of that. <laughs> and uh-huh. I guess... Um, Part of my approach, you know, to this whole thing is that obviously party politics mean that, you know, you belong to a tribe and you have your own core political beliefs. But going into the election, I was very determined to, especially in local elections, you know, you work with kind of people in your community who, you know, still care about the community and still want to do good things, but are coming at it from a different perspective. And so my approach has been the same approach I've taken throughout my work in life, which is to be collaborative, to be kind you know, to be empathetic. And I would often run into kind of opposing candidates on the campaign trail and and just be nice and say hello and, and be that person because I think life is life is too short um to be any other way really. But you are right, you know, people will instinctively dislike you because you represent a party that they don't kind of believe in. Um and that that's difficult. But I, I learned pretty quickly not to try and change people's minds. And you know the election was in May and my diagnosis came in August so wow I guess you could say that last year was the kind of steepest learning curve I've had in but just realizing that it's a real thing you know the validation that I'm not weird or you're not just overly sensitive you know which I kind of told myself for years why can't you be less sensitive why can't you be less weird why can't you just snap out of this why um now I know that it's part of who I am and it actually brings lots of good things with it as well and and I just have had to learn to be a lot kinder to myself I think that's been the biggest um, learning from all of it. Has it been easier since you've learned about the terminology like that what rejection sensitive dysphoria even is and it is often a component of you know people with ADHD their experiences? Yes, definitely. So, you know, I can have that conversation with myself now. Um, I have a reminder on my phone that goes off at two o'clock every day and it says, you are not your mind, you are the one that hears it. You know, that idea that the feelings are not real, the feelings are feelings and they will pass and that it's okay. Because I think for a lot of ADHDs, at least kind of in my experience of the ones that I've spoken to, and something that's really interesting, sorry, complete Oxbow Lake conversationally, but um, a lot of my friends have turned out to either have ADHD or be going through the diagnosis process, which as I'm sure it won't be a surprise, but that means I've had lots of really interesting conversations with people. And I know that that kind of idea of having a big emotional response to things, whether that's kind of upset or a sense of injustice or excitement a lot of the time, um, you know, what whatever that 
kind of emotional reaction is in knowing that it's transient and that it will pass and that this these are how emotions work you know it's really it feels like that you know the kids um film is it called oh, what's it called where people, i can't remember the film now where um they, they kind of cartoonify emotions oh, i'm sure it's a pixar film or something anyway i saw it and it was brilliant and such a i don't thing. know Oh, okay. I'm so sorry, but I've obviously gone down a road of something I can't remember now. But um, someone will let us know. <laughs> someone will know out there, please. <laughs> but yeah, just kind of that understanding that emotions are a difficult area or can be a difficult area for me because I have ADHD. But it, yeah, it's really interesting. I guess in my career, I've managed. I've built some really kind of um, workaround tools, and you know, I, I have. I've managed really well because I've I've been in environments, you know, not just since entering politics, but you know, my my entire business relied on being able to kind of work with people, work with um, different types of people, manage conflict, have difficult conversations. Uh, I go to pitches, you know, pitch for business and sometimes win and sometimes lose and be able to pick yourself back up after that. So um, what I realized post-diagnosis is that I'd actually constructed all of these kind of various ways of coping with that. Mm-hmm that I hadn't even realized were coping mechanisms. I just thought, you know, that's just what I do. It's what everybody do and does, isn't it? You know? Can you give us an example? Running. Um, I'm just wait, moving. Wait, wait. Are we talking about like as exercise running? Yeah. Sorry. So running um, uh-huh. and just moving the just concept of moving my body. So I've always danced and that's something that's just occurred to me on this podcast but um yeah from a very young age I would go to disco dancing classes and I would just love dancing around the living room and I would do it for hours and hours I've always had this kind of need to move my body and and not be still um for too long which you know brings its own (laughs) its own issues but running has been a way that I've kind of coped with difficulty on those days when I've had to have difficult conversations or you know where there's been kind of conflict to resolve it's I always feel like if I go for a run then things feel a lot more manageable even if it's just half an hour because it gives me that space I need to process and so that I don't respond emotionally um, or or from that place of kind of um, over emotion if that's a thing so your running um, has been a really big way that I've I guess I've I've managed that, but I've only just started to realize that that's what running has been for me, really. Yeah. So is politics fun? I mean, do you think that's a good fit for your brain? Is it fun? (laughs) Um, Oh, my God. Have you been a woman on the Internet? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, but you did it. And so I'm really curious if it if it's meaningful, I mean, I'm sure there are, there are times that are hell, but I'm also, I also suspect that there are times when you, you really feel like you're making a difference or do yeah. you? Yes, there are. And I won't pretend that um, <laughs> there's not a lot of kind of tedious process and a lot of frustration, a lot of frustration when you can't do the things that you believe to be the right things or that resources just don't, you know, with the way the economy is at the moment and the way politics is in the United Kingdom um, and yeah it, sometimes you just can't do as much as you'd like as quickly as you'd like and you have to say no to people or you have to tell people that you can't help them in the way that you would like to and I find that very very difficult and I've had to kind of develop some coping strategies for that. On the flip side it's an incredible privilege. So there have been um, examples of where I've been able to support constituents to make positive changes both in their individual cases, but kind of over the long longer term for other people as well. Um, and, you know, that doesn't happen often, but when it happens, it's incredibly, incredibly rewarding. And I guess I could, you kind of have to hang on to those um, and that keeps me afloat through the, um, through the times when... Uh, it's kind of, well, not- I mean, and so much of the change, right, is really at the local level. I mean, what we see is not that, but I mean, everything that I always read is you need to get involved at the local level. Yeah, I guess I was really inspired, actually. I came over to New York and met a, um, a councilwoman who was in Harlem, uh, Kristen, who was, I think, the first black lesbian councilwoman if I'm correct to sit on New York City Council and I had a great meeting with her and she was talking about you know things that she'd done to affect change and so much of what she was focused on was around community well-being and kind of teaching people um, in the community particularly young men um 
you know who are often o- overlooked in terms of mental health um kind of issue kind of how to kind of manage that so she was doing things like brilliant things that were so inspiring so putting on kind of yoga classes that you know mm-hmm. and I went to one in the YMCA in Harlem and loads of young men were coming to these things and you could see the positive change that she was making on the ground and that really helped kind of inspire me to want to do this I guess um and so much of it is about, you know, local politics is about, it's about, you know, people joke that it's about bins because if there's any, I don't, you call them trash cans, but um, we call them bins over here. Um, if there's one thing guaranteed to get people really, really passionately angry, um, it's change the way their bins are dealt with. So ah. you know, people, people joke about that. But in reality, you know, at, at least here in the UK, local government is responsible for social services, it's responsible for education, it's responsible for libraries, it's responsible for culture, for parks, for, um, you know, how we, looked af- how we look after children who, um, you know, are, are in the care system. So what local politicians do is incredibly, incredibly important, I think. Um, the thing that concerns me is that it can be a really febrile um atmosphere it's not easy for women um it's particularly not, not easy on uh, if you think about the kind of impact of twitter and the internet and yeah. social media in terms of the toxicity of some of the abuse and the, the kind of misogyny that women in yeah. politics can get and the thing that concerns me is that i think you know and this is a huge generalization because we've all met women that um <laughs> don't necessarily have this level of empathy you know i, I don't want to over generalize here but i think that what women can bring to politics is really special and is really important and we need it now more than ever. We need empathy, we need kindness, we need the ability to sit down and work with the opposition, you know, where there is common ground. We need to be able to identify that common ground because the challenges that we face are too big for us not to do that. You know, the challenges around climate change, the challenges around child poverty, particularly um in Wales, these are these are wicked problems. They and they are they are too big. Um you know, and and they haven't been fixed to date. So, you know, I look at leaders like Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand and what made her so brilliant. And I think that empathy piece is really, really important. But unless, you know, unless the landscape changes, unless it becomes less toxic, if if I had a daughter, would I encourage her to go into politics? No, I don't think so. Um, And that makes me kind of really sad because I honestly genuinely believe that if you put mainly women (laughs) in charge of the world then you know maybe we'd find solutions to some of these problems a lot sooner we'd do it in a very different way at least you know absolutely and I think the reason we are in this mess is because for so long women have been excluded I was recently reading like over the last two or three days it was a graph on I think the 10 happiest countries (laughs) five of them were run by women Oh, wow. The 10 happiest countries in the world, and it was more than half, or at least half were run by women. When you consider how few women, you know, run countries, that's that's pretty damn impressive. That really is. That's huge. That's so, I didn't see that list, but it does not surprise me one bit because if you think about it, women as women, you know, we are service users that understand things like how to plan local transport if you have mm-hmm. care and responsibilities and you need to use public transport to get your child to nursery and then to go and you know care for an elderly relative or you know we use those services we rely on them um in, in lots of cases uh, you know in my case I was a single mum I was on kind of what you yes. call welfare for a little bit um, yep. before I went back to work in my 20s that's a whole other story so I have first-hand experience of what it feels like to live um in kind of financial precarity and, and what that does to you and your mental health and right and I just think the more perspectives you can have in a room, you know, it's not just about gender, it's about um, your kind of ethnic backgrounds, it's about the, the age as well, diversity of age, it's about just having different voices in the room that aren't grey-haired white men in suits because, you know, they've had their chance. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like they've... Yeah, they've and, and what do you think happens to kids who are raised in these precarious situations, right? They end up with their own mental health struggles and then you know, government pays for that for the rest of their lives. Like, it makes no sense to me. I'm sure you've read the book Invisible Women, right? Yes, I have. Yeah. Oh, my God, that book is so brilliant. It's a good book. Um, and you're so right, Tracy, because and I get really passionate about this. We are so tied into short-term ele- kind of electoral cycle thinking 
that nobody thinks about, well, 30 years. So we're seeing it now with AI. We're seeing it with the impact of technology. We're seeing mm-hmm. that, that happen right now, that we, 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 we're not getting to grips with this. We knew this was coming. We knew this was coming a long time ago, the same way we knew about climate change. But people think about, how do I win the next election? So we're thinking in four and five year terms. But the, the issue with children that you just brought up, if you bring children up or you force children or you yeah, force children, but you create the climate where children are brought up in financial precarity, then the likelihood of them having addiction issues, you know, mental health yeah. issues, you know, and entering the criminal justice system, and it's all trauma based. Um, mm-hmm. And the cost of the public purse down the line is so much more. You know, you're storing up such big problems for the future. And yeah, I guess that's what drove me to do this. <laughs> so when, sorry, I'm coming back to it. This is a really long winded way to ask you, uh, answer your oh, question. I love it. Um, did I do the right thing? Yes, because I'm passionate about it. And I'm very, very passionate about wanting to make a change in my community and just do the tiny bit that, you know, whatever I can. Um, and it won't be enough. It'll never feel like enough to me. That's, the, you know, that's part of the problem, I guess. But yeah. yes, I feel like I'm fi- kind of finally doing something that feels like it, it gives me a sense of a real purpose um, in my life. Yeah. And we need that. We need to live that life of meaning. <laughs> we're yeah, not happy if we're not. Don't we? Well, I spent years kind of trying to work out what where the purpose would come from. Honestly, the amount of times I've you know I've volunteered for lots of different projects, I've you know tried so many different things, um, and nothing really stuck. And I just didn't feel like it was the, you know the right thing, or I could make a big enough difference. And I guess for now, this is the thing that I'll try. But I also know that there'll be something else. There'll be more, and there'll, <laughs> something else will be around the corner. So my kind of um, current thing is I'm involved in a parliamentary. Um, campaigning group in the UK to try and change basically legislation in the UK around ADHD and how it's treated in the criminal justice system, mm-hmm. and how it's treated in the education system, so um, and, and healthcare settings. So you know, you see now that I've opened my eyes to it post my diagnosis, I can't unsee the, the the kind of injustice. And I see in my own casework as well. Mums come to me with, um, you know, children who are neurodiverse, sometimes ADHD, sometimes kind of other conditions, who are really struggling because they do not get the support that they need, and there's just yeah. not that awareness and understanding in the school setting. And quite often, schools just don't have the funding to deal with this. It's not a lack of will on behalf of the teachers you know it's just a sheer lack of funding um, well an education too i mean i would suspect that they're like our american you know teachers here where they're not trained on what adhd even looks like no um and i don't think teachers here have enough training um on adhd either and i you know it's, there's a lot for teachers to do beyond you know oh the, they have the, yeah. the slog of teaching it's, their fault. Fault. it's the but, system but it's the system, you know, as so often, as so often, it's a system. And then you ask yourself, well, who designs the system? And, <laughs> Here we go, full circle. Always a good question, I think. <laughs> so what do you wish you could tell your younger undiagnosed self when she was struggling, Sarah, today? Well, my comedy answer to that is, <laughs> I would say you have ADHD, but you don't mm-hmm. have the internet for another 20 years. <laughs> You won't be able to find out anything about it now with my serious uh, face on. I guess I would tell myself that it would all be okay one day. Oh, and then one one day I would find a tribe of people like me. So um, I I came to do this uh, podcast interview just off the back of spending a few hours with um, a close friend of mine who hasn't been diagnosed, but absolutely, you know, she's convinced that she, she has ADHD and we mirror each other's energy, you know, and I, when I, you know, that idea of people being radiators or vampires. So vampires kind of suck all your energy and make you feel really bad after you've left them. Um, and radiators kind of just radiate heat and, you know, positivity and energy. And, and when I leave them, I just feel better. Um, somehow. Wait, wait, wait. So I, I didn't understand the word you used. So I understand vampire. What's the other one? The a opposite? Radiator. You know, like a radiator. A vampire or a radiator. Yeah, that's something ah, that I've never heard that. Oh, no. And maybe it's a me thing, but um, <laughs> I, mean, I kind of put people into those boxes. You know, you're either a vampire, so you suck my energy. Yes. Or you give me energy. And I, and I try and um, surround myself with people who um, give me energy, I guess. And what I tell my younger self is that you will one day be able to find a tribe, a group of amazing women. Um, and not all women, um, either, I should say that who kind of share your energy and mirror your energy and you are able to be yourself around. Um, Yeah, I think I'd tell her that. Yeah. 
brilliant advice. So what are the ADHD traits that you feel are responsible for your success? Oh, okay. So uh, the thing is, I've, I've never really seen myself as a success. Um, I just do the things that I'm really interested in. And I guess the perfectionist in me means I want to do them as well as possible. And I guess inevitably that on um, paper can look like success, you know, you win awards or, um, you know, blah, 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 blah. But actually telling myself that I'm successful is a, is a whole other thing. And I think it's about how you define success anyway. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And some of the happiest people I know are not people you would kind of describe as successful, inverted commas. So I see success as the people who've carved out enough time to spend quality time with their families, for example, and to pursue their passions. You know, I think the fetishization of busyness um, can be a very damaging thing, I think, for the individual. But having said that... um, I guess you know, on paper, people think I'm successful. So what is um, what are the traits that have helped me with that? Well, I think my ability to hyper-focus, so my ability to just really kind of, you know, sit there and get the thing done, um, although that's, you know, that's hard as well because I have long periods where I find that a struggle. But when I'm interested in something, you know, the phrase that I always come back to is the right kind of difficult. And I think... Um, Ed Hallowell. Yeah, exactly. I love I love his work. Um, I think when I find the right find kind of difficult, you know, I will be, and I'm so tenacious. And I think that tenacity um, is really has been really important for me, especially in starting a business. I was a single mum. You know, I had uh, kind of I, I risked a lot. I left a well paid job to start my first business, and it was kind of terrifying. But that meant I had to make it work. You know. Um, and that, that's where the kind of tenacity really comes in. I think the other thing that um, I've been reflecting on is that I've always been able to spot new trends quite a long time before they enter the mainstream. And I have no idea why. I don't know yeah. where that comes from. Um, so in relation to what we're doing right now, back in 2004, I wrote a newspaper article about how podcasting was the future of broadcasting. Um, and, you know, I wrote this kind of really passionate piece about how podcasting and on-demand audio, and remember at the time we were using MP3 machines, you know, and you had to point clunkily drag a file and it was a really horrible user experience. Um, but I was convinced that if the tech, when the tech caught up, this would be the way we all listened in the future. And of course, that what happened then? podcasting died of death (laughs) for about about 10 years Um, and then Apple you know put the podcasting app native app on its um, operating system and now it's huge and now it's primarily how I listen to radio and I guess I've always um, I'm not making myself out to be some kind of Nostradamus here but I, I, (laughs) I and I don't know where it comes from but that ability to kind of spot trends move quickly to jump on them so I've always been able to see so in my industry so communications for example being able to respond um to change to a very fast changing landscape in terms of the media in terms of the internet and how those two things interact um has been critical to me and then I guess connecting dots and seeing links between things that and until the diagnosis I didn't know that this was unusual I just thought well everybody sees the world this way and I'm starting Mm. to see that they really don't and it it is unique and it's one of the kind of you know I I don't know how I feel about the word superpowers um but I do think it's a I do think those things have been kind of superpowers for me and also um and this is what I love about kind of being my own boss I guess and being self-employed and I know lots of ADHDers out there who either work for themselves or who aspire to work for themselves or who have some kind of side um project going on will know that the best thing is being able to have an idea in the shower <laughs> and then within, within 15 minutes have sent the email and kind of, you know, put put the ball in train to make that idea happen. So um, I don't mess around, I guess, when I have an idea, I can act on it very, very quickly um, and often from just a place of intuition. And sometimes it's wrong and sometimes my intuition is wrong, but usually the majority of the time um, it's right. And I'm really glad I did those things. So I, I have this kind of theory that just say yes to things and, you know, make it work later, you know, um, which has served me really well, um, I, I think, really. And then just creativity and problem solving, which I absolutely think is linked to my ADHD. You know, I now realize that lots of the creative um, people in my life and kind of artists that I know, um you know are neurodiverse and I guess you know that creativity has really driven everything that I've done from you know starting to write for newspapers as a teenager right up to starting my own business every single campaign I've designed has you know depended on 
a level of creativity um and I still need to be really creative in in my kind of political role but also in my in my day job in my business I you know that creativity is the thread that runs through all of it I guess and I attribute all of these things um very proudly to my ADHD ah well that's a lot so what do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD is oh this is such a good question so I had to think really, really hard about this because it's been, um, it still feels like a really new diagnosis um, to me. But I guess for me, um, boundaries are really important. So when you understand more about yourself, you can be more boundary to the people around you. And I think something that lots of ADHD women in particular struggle with is boundaries. So I think having an awareness um, of your boundaries and being able to communicate them is really important um for me it's about being able to take regular breaks so being able to be out in nature to change my setting I don't perform very well if I'm kind of you know chained to a laptop for 10 hours a day I need to be near water or or kind of around trees and I, I find that that is kind of really really helpful for me and I now know why it's so important for me so I make sure now that I kind of build in time to do that um The other thing that has really, really been helpful for me is meditation. So, um, and I know, I don't know if you can identify with this, but for years, I could never meditate. I I would try so hard. Well, I wouldn't try hard, that's the point. I would sit down, I would open the app, I would sit there for two minutes. My brain would be so busy, I'd just give up and think, well, I just can't do it, I can't do it. And I'd get frustrated and then I'd start. Um, But then last year, I discovered transcendental meditation, which is a particular form of meditation. It's a northern Indian form of meditation. Um, It's the same one that the Beatles went out to India to do. I guess that's how people might kind of know it best. But it's a very simple technique. I really wish I'd (laughs) I'd learned it years ago because um, it's been life changing for me. So every day I meditate, Um, not, not always twice a day, but at least once a day. And those 20 minutes almost feel like a shower for my brain. You know, when you take your body in the shower and you wake up out, you, you walk up feeling refreshed and ready to face the day. Meditation is that shower for my brain. So what is it about transcendental meditation that works for your brain? You said it's really easy. Yeah, which is really surprising because I was quite cynical about it, but a friend recommended it to me and I thought, well, I'll try anything because I know that I, post-diagnosis, I knew that I needed to find ways um, to make space for my brain to be quiet because, you know, that, you know, the analogy of having the brain power of a Ferrari, but the braking speed of a really bad bicycle or a really cheap bicycle, um, I knew that, so I, I've had cycles of kind of boom and burnout. Um, I don't know if that sounds familiar to you in, in my life, but where, you know, you go 120 miles an hour and then you're forced to stop because your body tells you to. Um, and I didn't want to live that way anymore. So I was seeking out ideas. Um, a friend recommended it. I did a three-day course. And, and the basic kind of principle of transcendental meditation, which is different to any other types, is that it doesn't try to teach you that you have to push the thoughts out and um, it kind of invites the thoughts in, but it's all based on a, um, a mantra. So you have the word that you repeat internally. And the idea is that this word becomes a little bit like a rope, you know, a kind of safety or an anchor, something that you, your, your mind kind of clings to. And when your mind is wandering too far, you just bring it back to the anchor. And it's a very, it sounds very, very simple, but it's, um, really really helped me because uh, I tried headspace I've tried you know various apps that just didn't work for my brain and I've since read that um, TM is very very helpful for the ADHD brain and the the, um, wonderful teacher who taught me said that she has often had people come to her who've said you know I've been diagnosed with ADHD I just can't meditate Um, and many of them leaving um, feeling like I do really which I've finally found the thing um, that works so yeah I'm not on commission (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it makes yeah. sense, Sarah, because you're saying that instead of pushing thoughts away or like, I'm not allowed to think about this, I'm not, you know, I'm not allowed to think about this, you're actually inviting those thoughts in. So yeah. you're doing that anyway, so it would be easier for us. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, just having that mantra, you know, that you keep repeating internally, mm. um, has, I don't know why, what it is. I'd, I'd really love to understand more about the science. Um, and I've actually on my desk 
currently I'm looking at American director, you know, David Lynch, who directed Twin Peaks. So yeah. He, um, he is kind of the big, uh, not, not just spokesperson, but kind of advocate for um, transcendental meditation in the US. Um, and he has a book called Catching the Big Fish, Meditation, Consciousness and Creativity, which I haven't read, but um, yeah, it's kind of staring at me. But um, I have heard very, very good things about it. And I guess it's different for everybody, isn't it? I don't think I know the key to living successfully with ADHD yet. I'm still learning. I'm still kind of on this journey of discovery. But for me, you know, boundaries, exercise, daily meditation um, and kind of finding my tribe, you know, and finding a community of brilliant women who um, I've been really, really lucky to be able to do has been really, really important for me, I think. Hmm. Well, that is all lovely. You know, my husband um, has. Um... He has practiced transcendental meditation literally for decades. Wow. And I always joke with him. I'm like, no, you're sleeping. You're sleeping. I'm so glad. <laughs> you know, my partner has said that to me as well. Like, you're sick. Could you put an eye mask on to meditate to block out the light? Um, and, uh, yeah, he definitely thinks I'm just using it as a, an excuse to have a sneaky nap. Um, <laughs> Um, and some, you know, oh my God, I forgot this happened. So a few weeks ago I was meditating and I got to such a deep state of relaxation, which has never happened before. I was never able to sleep during the day. Um, you know, I'm sh- I don't know if you're the same, but yeah. I'd always kind of, once I'm awake, that's it. I'm awake and I'm yep. instantly awake. Um, and that's it. I'm off for the day. Well, and if I go to sleep, I'm not waking back up, right? Yeah. If I go yeah. at four o'clock and take a nap. Yeah. It's yeah. over. <laughs> it's game over. Yeah, same. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was in a deep state of meditation and I had a um, personal training session booked on Zoom. And so I knew that the bell was going to go off at the end of the meditation. And then I would get ready for my session. Um, and I was in such a deep state of kind of relaxation. And I woke up. And I don't know how long it had been. It turned out it had been about an hour and this was supposed to be a 20 minute meditation. And my phone had 11 missed calls and it turned out that I completely missed my session. Uh And I was so alarmed and so amazed because I've never done that before. But I guess it just shows you how it can take you to a really kind of deep place of relaxation. And I think it also showed me at the time that I needed that rest, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, kind of it creates space for you to listen to those cues in, in your body and, and in your mind as well, I think, which I know makes me sound like a crazy hippie, but I'm really glad you <laughs> did it as well because I wasn't sure whether to talk about it because it's a fairly new discovery for me. I've just been doing it since Christmas. Yeah. Well, and I suspect that it was your body's way of telling you, you know, you don't need that personal training session. You need this, right? Yeah. In that. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I've got a lot of napping to catch up on, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Sarah, yeah. where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? Uh, so they can go to my website, which is Sarah Robinson Coms. That's S A R A R O B I N S O N C O M M S dot co dot UK. Um, they can find me on there. Um, I'm not actually on Twitter anymore. I left Twitter when Elon Musk um, yeah. took over because it's a bit like a bin fire on there. Um, and I have a locked account on Instagram. So probably that's the best place to find me. There's an email address for me um, on there. And yeah, I'd be really happy to hear from from anybody, really, anybody who has any experiences to share or who wants to find out more about um, the, you know, the WhatsApp group that I mentioned. I'd be really happy to um, connect, connect them up. Wonderful. So we will put all of this in the show notes. Sarah, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. It was just a delight to speak with you. Oh, it's been so lovely to speak with you. I, I'm not just saying this. Listening to your podcast was so helpful to me as I was contemplating diagnosis and then processing the diagnosis. So I can't believe I'm actually on here. I, yeah, I feel very starstruck. So thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So that's what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Sarah, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over at tracyotsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. 
You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is a OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.